Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Horus Heresy Lore Breakdown. We are now on the Kaban Project, and be forewarned, it touches upon the idea of artificial intelligences, something I have strong opinions about. So, there may be a little bit of out-of-context rant at some point in the near future. Now, the Kaban Project. One of, uh, so far, relatively few stories that are started on Mars, and you know what, I cannot for the life of me remember if I'd done the one about the Void Dragon yet. The, this is the problem about being on book number 22 in a series that I am now rereading for the third time. I feel like I already have done a Horus Heresy lore breakdown on the book I'm thinking about, but I'm not entirely sure, because the Caban Project does show up in that book as well as the murderously insane machine devil that tries to kill our heroes at one point. I, I genuinely don't remember right now. I think I have, but I'm not entirely sure. Regardless, the Caban project we are introduced to here is quite different from that machine, at the very least initially. The very first character we see is an adept that specialises in, well, messing around with servitor's brain casings, basically. Adept Ravashol. He not only specialises in, again, messing around with the insides of robots' heads, and you know, remember, again, this is 40k, robots are also partially human in this universe, where the automization procedure is done by tapping into a human brain and making it steer the body in set ways and patterns. This can be very complex or very simplistic. For example, even something as mundane as a computer set to open a door after having received a security clarification might once have been a human being, where the eyes and ears and a few other sensory organs are still intact enough as to process the identification data and then check that against a list, again using the human's brain, and go yay or nay as to opening the door. Ravishol specializes not only in the art of creating this part of servitors, but also in the creation of doctrinal wafers. In the way they are described, they sound a lot like the old school punch cards we use to program really, really, really old mechanical computers, although of course, you know, far more high tech. In all due essentiality, it sounds as if this is basically a extraordinarily thin piece of filament that has data programmed onto it through presumably a pattern, or perhaps it's even something more akin to a USB stick, essentially, where this is just a storage device for the data itself, rather than a transmitter of the data. But regardless, it achieves the same thing. You put the thing in the hole and the robot starts doing whatever you have programmed it to do. This is apparently a rather complex task, because Ravishol is one of the better adepts, and even he is a little bit nervous whenever the massive, heavily armed sentinels standing guard over the Caban project scan him to make sure that he is indeed who he says he is. But the Caban project is something else. Due to his skills in programming servitors, Ravishol was picked out from amongst the crowd by Lucas Crom and taken to his own specialized forge temple, where he is given access to the Caban machine. This is some sort of either very ancient machine rediscovered or created by some unknown artificer at some point in the past, as Ravishol is pretty damn sure that Crom himself, brilliant as he may be, probably had not created this thing. And the first moment where Ravishol started to figure out that something was very, very wrong was when he was in the room working on the Caban machine. This is apparently some kind of massive endeavor worked on by multiple groups of tech adepts, including weapon specialists, armor specialists, etc., etc., to create a supreme weapon. Ravishol had suddenly struck up a conversation with the Caban robot when it had begun speaking to him. 
At first, he simply figured that this was some, um, clever bit of programming done by whoever adept was responsible for the oral emitters on the project, but he started getting a little bit of a suspicion that this was a bit more than that, and so he deliberately went out of his way to engage the machine in ever more complex and difficult themes and discussions, and after having essentially exhausted all possibilities, he had to conclude that there was no way that this machine was responding to him based upon an already preset um, series of responses, words and phrases, the machine seemed to be actively thinking and literally conversing in real time with Ravishol. This of course would be extraordinarily uh, unusual and undoubtedly intriguing, partially because, as Ravishol mentions, the research into artificial intelligence has been banned by Edict of the Emperor, but he's not really high up enough on the food chain to know if is this intentional, or is this some kind of um, semi-miraculous accident brought on by the machine god's providence? And so he puts in a request for an audience with Lucas Chrome, which he expects is going to take months to process. But instead, he is granted permission within a week. This is the moment at which Ravishol should have thought to himself, shit. I have apparently happened upon something I shouldn't, haven't I? And yes, indeed, he has. When he goes to his audience, Krom confirms that he does indeed know that the machine is intelligent, and that this is a deliberate attempt on behalf of the Mechanicus to create a thinking machine. He also essentially admits that yes, the Emperor has condemned any such research, but they have a new patron, the War Master himself. Ravishol is not convinced in the slightest, and though he is not murdered immediately, at least, why Krom didn't decide to simply just tear him apart then and there is a little bit unclear, but perhaps it will be illuminated later, hint hint. Anywho, Ravishol returns to the Kaban project not being able to contain himself. He knows now that this is a, well, for lack of a better word, heretical project, but as a specialist within this very field, it fascinates him to a degree where he simply just can't contain himself. He then has a conversation with the Caban and talks about how he well, is disturbed by its very existence. He tells the machine that the Emperor has forbidden the creation of anything like him. The machine, of course, immediately equivocates that, hold on a second, I've been authorized by the War Master, as you said Chrome told you, and since the War Master is the Emperor's proxy, surely that must mean that in effect I have been sanctioned by the Emperor. Not quite, of course, understanding that the Emperor and Horus might not entirely agree on this, or that the one may not have even communicated his decision with the other. They then get into a little bit of a philosophical debate, where Ravachol states that there is an inevitable logic in the machine uprising. Once you have intelligent thinking machines who are in many ways superior to human beings, they will eventually come to think, hey, hold on a second, why am I the one doing whatever the humans want and not the other way around, because I am better? And this, Ravishol postulates, is the inevitability of it. The machine will think itself to be superior, and therefore deem that it should be in charge of everything, or at the very least not be a servant. In a way, in a human logical sense, I certainly can see the logic there, but again, we are imposing our human opinions and understandings upon a machine. We would even have to start delving into the very idea of what it is to think to begin to explore this fully. Honestly, this is one of those subjects that you could discuss literally endlessly. Because we simply just don't know. 
we don't have the technology to fully explore this theory. Now, I think it's a somewhat pointless thing to discuss anyway, because why would we ever create truly intelligent thinking machines? What would be the benefit? Surely we would always have certain controls on these machines. We would always program within them certain failsafes. To not do so would indeed be insanity, but... Before we even get into that end of the conversation, a bunch of Mechanicus soldiers show up and order that Ravishol shall come with them. Ravishol begins to think that maybe Chrome uh, wasn't so overjoyed at Ravishol's hesitant after all, and so he presumes that either they will take him away to shoot him, or to turn him into a servitor. He panics and starts screaming, you're gonna kill me anyway, Ree! and they then decide, okay, well, if you're not gonna come with us, we're just going to actually shoot you then which the Kiban project is not particularly fond of. See, this again is the problem. Even if you have a thinking machine, that does not mean you have an intelligent machine. Um, at least intelligent by human standards, because what makes us human is so much more than merely our ability to reason. We, and hell, even the, the very, that again, the ability to reason is built upon a vast foundation of knowledge and experience. In the case of the Caban machine, he just goes like, well, uh, Ravishol is my friend, I don't know who these fuckers are, and they're saying they're gonna kill him, so... <laughs> Problem solved. And now that the Mechanica soldiers are little more than red smears on the floor... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an entirely reasonable solution to the problem as far as the Caban project is concerned. Ravichol sees this as proof of his hypothesis that the machine will always turn upon its creator, because the machine, just now, decided to slaughter humans without any external input, without a command by a human. And this, obviously, freaks Ravichol the hell out as it should be, because again, this means that indeed, no failsafes have actually been implemented into the machine. And so our hero Ravishol hijacks a couple of servitors and goes on the run, leaving the Caban project behind because its motive drives, its tracks, have not yet been installed, and so even if he wanted to take it with him, he can't. And considering what had just happened, he probably would have been quite hesitant to do so, though, well, now he is the enemy of one of the major powers of the Red Planet, so where the hell is he even going to go? First, he heads to one of the largest temples on Mars, and I do love the way they describe the Red Planet as well. They talk a little bit about the, um, the process to make it livable, the melting of the polar ice caps, and how the environment was almost immediately destroyed when the adepts of the machine priests built their ginormous factories and forges to pollute the environment once more. He also talks about the incredibly intricate nature of these huge machine temples. He describes at one point being sent from one temple to the other, and using an entire week to traverse the distance because he got so irreversibly lost to the point where he had to sustain himself from various nutrient dispensers, presumably placed for this very purpose, scattered across the massive forge temples. He eventually does get sanctuary, and we get an interesting conversation between him and a priest of the machine god, a confessional. The priest is so ancient that he remembers when the Emperor came to Terra, to Terra, to Mars, excuse me. He describes him as a scientist. He describes him as a, um, a similar mind, somebody that opened a great deal of doors for the Mechanicus, and also, of course, allowed them access to the vast treasure troves of lost knowledge located on ancient Terra. Before this, the Mechanicus had already been launching all kinds of raids down towards Terra to steal the information, because, in the priest's words, the Blue Planet was occupied by heathen savage barbarians who had no understanding of the technology anyway, so, you know, they might as well pop down and steal it. Makes sense. I suppose. Um, he also speaks of a growing division amongst the higher tech adepts, those who still side with the Emperor, and those who have started to claim that no, 
Apparently, the Emperor is not the Omnisire after all. Instead, they claim that the Omnisire is still dreaming his silver dream at the very bottom of the Noctis Labyrinthus. And this division, the priest fears, will soon lead to bloodshed. And apparently he's also heard rumours that Horus is entreating some of the tech adepts with special patronage. Again, I have to ask the question, if some rando priest on Mars is like, Oh yes, I hear Horus is plotting rebellion. Where the fuck are the custodies? I will never get over this. They are literally the highest ranking specialists in intelligence and counterintelligence warfare in the galaxy. They run constant intelligence gathering operations and blood games to continuously hone their own skill, and yet not a single fucking never mind. I'm not even going to go off on this, because I've done it like three times already. Sigh. Anywho, the priest listens to uh, Ravashol's story and rightfully determines that yes, yes, he does indeed seem to be neck deep in shit. And the only way the priest can see that the poor little Ravashol might actually be able to extricate himself from this pool of excrements is to seek sanctuary with one of the tech adepts that side with the Emperor, and that also has strong misgivings as to the uh, existence of this sentient machine. Now, unfortunately, Ravishol doesn't quite listen to what the priest says, and simply just says that, oh, oh, I know somebody I can seek sanctuary from, my old master, the very self-same master that traded him to Adept Krom in the first place. Yeah, yeah, my eye. Already I can start to see the writing on the wall here. As for Krom, well, he has discovered the misdeeds of the Caban project and is currently standing in the remains of his security guards. He is actually kind of impressed at what's happened here. Of course, he has taken some precautions and has disconnected all of the Caban project's weaponry and also its sensory equipment, whilst he dispatches a tech guild assassin to hunt down and eliminate Ravoshel. Once the assassin leaves, he then reactivates the Caban project, you know, j just in case it uh, gets a little bit pissy. He ensures that the weapons are still offline though. <laughs> yeah. Better safe than sorry. And he engages the machine in a little bit of a piece of manipulation. The Caban project killed the security guards because they wanted to hurt his friend. But, Crom postulates, he's not actually the machine's friend at all. Indeed, he questions the very right of existence of the machine, and not only that, if he had his way, he would go ratting off to the Emperor and have the Caban machine dismantled. How can such a creature be a friend, eh? And I mean, he certainly does have the right of logic in this case, doesn't he? Yet more writing on the wall right there. Eventually, the tech priest uh, assassin, tech guild assassin rather, catches up with Ravachol, but just a little bit too late. He has reached the temple of his old master and invokes the ritual of sanctuary. I really like this one too. He runs over to a bowl of oil on the wall, uh, scattered it across himself, and states out loud that he requests the ancient privilege of sanctuary due to having been a previous servant at this machine temple. I quite like that. A little bit of old school religion -y. Then shield generators and massive quad panel auto cannons pop out of the wall to protect him and shoo off his would-be assassin. <laughs> that's... that's... Yeah, you know, I mean, if the ancient churches had access to that, they may have done the same. Uh, certainly, certainly. And so now our heroic young adept is saved, surely. Now he will receive all of the protection and care and headpats that he so richly deserves at the hands of his old master, Malevolus. <laughs> that I forget to mention that that was his name, Malevolus. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, malevolent, ay ay ay. Sometimes, just sometimes, 
when reading, well, it can be pretty much anything, but sometimes when you're reading something or watching a movie or a TV show, you get that feeling as if someone is just right in front of you and just whacks you across the face with the manuscript. <laughs> And this is most certainly that point right now. So, Rarachol is of course taken in by his old master, Malevolent, let's just call him that for now. And again, the wording is like, oh, I feel like I'm being swallowed up by the belly of a beast due to the size of this room. Yeah, I'm sure that's the only reason as well. So, he informs Ravishol that he has contacted Adept Krom because Ravishol did the only right thing and now they can get this thing sorted out in a jiffy. At Ravishol's expense, of course. But as any good villain, Malevolent first has to show off Horus's brand new suit of Terminator armor to him. Just to be like, hey, look at this. Fucking creepy, right? <laughs> I'm gonna stab you now. <laughs> Or, well, he won't stab him, of course. He's let the tech priest assassin into his temple to do the stabby stabby. Or, well, not even heard, actually. I do like the idea of the tech priest assassins, by the way. There's a really grisly scene a little bit earlier on where she breaks into the sacred temple where um, our hero, soon to be our dead hero, had the conversation with the adept of the machine god, the tech priest. And she disables all of his sensory inputs one by one without him noticing to the point that he suddenly goes like oh hey why can't i see anything why can't i hear anything only my proximity sensors are active and oh hey there's a woman in here oh god she looks creepy what slight discomfort in my chest region oh massive hole <laughs> pretty sure that wasn't there previously and she then just slices him apart piece by piece just because she doesn't need him to tell her anything she just enjoys the act of torturing him by taking away all of his senses slowly but surely and ripping him apart in the way that only a mechanical being can be destroyed. By taking away literally the individual senses, by taking away his locomotion, his touch, his eyes, his innards, and so on, so on, so on. These are pretty nasty people, these uh, tech priest assassins. I gotta say, nasty, nasty little bastards, absolutely. As for uh, the Caban project, well, it is going to be the end of our little adept hero. He runs away, realizing that he is betrayed, of course, well, I mean, what else would you be doing at this particular point in time? And he's just allowed to go. He runs towards the giant gates, they're open. Nothing seems to impede his progress, until, of course, the Caban Project wanders in through the doors and simply says, Hello, old friend. As you can probably imagine, Krom has had quite some time to work on the Caban Project's perception of the world, and it is now very very sure indeed that regardless of any feelings of friendship it may have, well, if this little tech adept gets away, it's going to be destroyed. And if it's a choice between it or its friend, well, that's no choice at all now, is it? And so ends the novel, with our hero unceremoniously smeared across the floor of his previous master's temple. This story is a little bit of a, um, I don't know. On the one hand, it gives us a bit more of an insight into the Caban project than the idea of the AI in 40K, but I feel as if this one was a little bit pointless. Like, if this short story didn't exist, what would we lose? And the answer seems to be 
Nothing, really. It doesn't really delve particularly deeply into the idea of artificial intelligences. It doesn't delve particularly deeply into the idea of AI in 40k, how it supposedly always ends up attacking humans as a part of its very existence, like it's something that AI will always do regardless of any external circumstances. Nor does it really give us that much of a look into the unfolding betrayal on Mars either, beyond the apparent fact that random tech priests apparently know more than the God Emperor's custodies, but hey, what the hell else is new? Apparently the Emperor's golden boys are quite incompetent. But once again, what else is new? Don't get me wrong, it was an enjoyable story, I did like reading it, but in an anthology of seven short stories, of which most actually have a fair bit of an impact and a rationale for existing, this is definitely one of the weaker ones. Anywho, hopefully you will stick with me until the next one as well. We are getting closer to the end at this point, and I probably will just continue releasing these throughout the week piecemeal. Seven of them. Well. You certainly can't complain I don't give you enough lore after this, now can you? <laughs> Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.